So let's all welcome uh, Dr. Fred Kolb this morning. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I, uh, like Iowa, I live in a state where there's lots and lots of corn and beans, but I work on small grains. So when I get a chance to talk to people who are interested in small grains, that's a good day. And uh, it's great to see Stefan again. And uh, we, we always uh, really love it when uh, you see our former students that are doing well. So it's, it's great to be here. Uh, so I am going to talk about uh, wheat as well as uh, spring oats. And just a little bit of background. I am a, a plant breeder. Uh, I, I work on uh, soft red winter wheat and spring oats. Um, and I didn't know I was in the southern Midwest, but apparently that's true. Uh, we don't tend to think of ourselves as southern Midwest in, in Illinois, but compared to North Dakota and Minnesota <laughs> during the winter, that's definitely true. So um, I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about, since I am a plant breeder, uh, you got to talk about variety selection first. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about selection of wheat varieties. Hopefully I won't overlap too much with the presenters from yesterday or other presenters today. I'm going to talk a bit about management practices in wheat. And then we'll shift to spring oats and talk about selection of spring oat varieties and then also management uh, of uh, spring oats. So I probably don't need to use this slide for this audience, but I always like to pause and think about what are the benefits of including small grains in production systems. And so these are some of the benefits that, that I see. Uh, the rotation is beneficial to the entire cropping system. Um, in Western Illinois, Emerson Knapsinger, who's a, a production management specialist, has done some research where they've done long-term rotation plots, and they've included wheat into corn and soybean rotation. And at two locations in that experiment, they found that including wheat in the rotation increases particularly corn yields. Um, it does sometimes help the soybean yield, but especially increases corn yields in that rotation. So I think there are a lot of benefits that in recent years we've kind of forgot about why we had small grains in rotations. Um, it also, as all of you know, spreads out the workload. It also spreads out the weather risks uh, because small grains are going to be uh, using water and maturing at a different time than corn and beans. Uh, it reduces your input costs, uh, generally. Uh, helps to reduce soil erosion, especially true for winter wheat, uh, when we have that uh, on the landscape through the winter. Um, it aids in weed control. If you get a good solid stand of wheat or oats, it definitely suppresses the weed pressure. And it may increase the soil organic matter, particularly if you don't re remove the straw. Um, it helps to break disease cycles, and that may be related to the, to the first item there. Uh, that may be part of what's going on there. And in the case, especially uh, for winter wheat, it serves as a cover crop. Uh, just in a little aside, uh, we hear a lot about cover crops, and when that topic comes up, I always like to throw in spring oats because a lot of times people forget that you can plant spring oats in the fall, you get uh, growth in the fall. Those spring oats, particularly in Iowa and Illinois, are going to die over the winter. And you can come in in the spring and plant without having to kill off those spring oats because the winter is going to do that for you. And so uh, oats can also serve as a cover crop as, as well as, as wheat. Now, Stefan and I were talking uh, just a little bit ago about Iowa being kind of a transition state where east of here, east of the Mississippi, pretty much everything, uh, with the exception of some of the local food production, uh, wheat production, pretty much all of the production is soft red winter wheat or in, 
in New York and Michigan soft white winter wheat. If you go north of here and west of here, you get into uh, hard red spring and hard red winter. And so I was kind of sitting in between those production areas. So you can uh, produce winter wheat or spring wheat here, I think. Um, and the, the key thing is you need to know your market before you plant because spring wheat and winter wheat are really two different commodities. Spring wheat is hard wheat, just like the, the hard red winter that is grown in, in Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota. That's also hard wheat. And you can't mix uh, hard wheat and soft wheat in the marketplace uh, unless you are blending intentionally to make some type of, of specialty flour. Um, so if you have soft red winter wheat, you need to make sure that you're marketing it separately and not mixing it with a hard wheat. Um, and I, as I said, in the eastern U.S., we're, we're producing uh, soft winter wheat. So the first decision that you have to make is what market class are you going to grow? And I know there's a lot of people that are interested in local food production, local milling. And so in that case, uh, you may be <coughs> more interested in hard wheat. And that's why we're actually seeing some hard wheat come back into the eastern U.S. But for the most part, the soft red winter wheat in particular is going to be higher yielding. And so, um, I don't know, maybe 40 years ago, Illinois had some hard wheat and some soft wheat, but it all switched over uh, to soft wheat. So the first thing you have to decide is, is what market class do you want to plant? And once you've answered that question and know where your market is, then you can uh, decide where you're going to source those varieties. <clears throat> so just a side comment that I wanted to throw in here. Uh, in the last number of years, my impression is that Iowa hasn't produced a lot of wheat. You guys can tell me if I'm wrong about that. But I don't see any reason why wheat can't be successfully produced here in Iowa. The key thing is going to be deciding which type of wheat you want to grow and which is going to be most successful for you. Obviously, I'm going to talk about winter hardiness uh, in a little bit. And if that's an issue, then you're going, to want to ha you're going to have to switch to spring wheat. But in general, as a general rule, a winter wheat is going to yield more than spring wheat. Um, so uh, that's something to keep in mind. But I was surrounded by states that produce a lot of wheat. So, um, there's no reason why it can't be produced here. Okay, so let's move into uh, variety selection uh, a little bit. So what I've listed here are some, not all, but some of the criteria that you need to think about when you're going to select a variety. Okay, so as a breeder, uh, I have high priority uh, breeding objectives, and I can't look at everything. Uh, the same thing is going to be true for you as you select a variety. So, my opinions here. Uh, I would put Fusarium head blight, also called scab, at the top of my priority list. Uh, that's true for my breeding program. I would make that true for your variety selection as well. And my reason for that is, and I'll talk a lot more about this disease a little bit later in the presentation, but the reason is that this disease can uh, dramatically impact your production and uh, the return that you get for the wheat. And so you really have to think about that right off the top. I, so, I would also put test weight at the top of my list. And my list is probably a little bit influenced by what happened this past year. In southern Illinois, where a lot of our wheat is produced, we had a lot of problems. We had scab problems. We had sprouting damage, which is unusual, but it was a lot of rain. And so what happened is farmers got discounted heavily for uh, infection with scab and low test weight. So you have to think about those. Um, two things. 
Then you're also going to think about yield. Uh, a lot of times we put that at the top of the list. I'm going to show you a little bit later why I don't think it should be um, at the top of the list. Here in Iowa, I think you need to think about winter hardness for winter wheat. Um, that is going to be a concern some years. Uh, you want to think about maturity. Um, it's not as much of an issue for you as it would be for some of our farmers in southern Illinois where they want to double crop. They look for early varieties. That wouldn't be an issue uh, for, for you, I don't believe. But we also, also need to think about resistance to lots of other diseases and uh, lodging resistance and height also considerations. Um, and we could add some more traits, but that's enough to start with. So, again, in case you didn't catch that, you should select varieties with scab resistance and high test weight. Uh, those would be my first two criteria. Um, and there are lots of sources for information on wheat varieties. Um, Stefan has listed some on your website. Uh, I've listed those. Hopefully you can read those websites on the, on the handout. Uh, basically, um, let's see here, which one am I supposed to that first top one? No, no, the middle one. The middle one, all right. Good I didn't push that. Yeah. All right, so this is the variety trial website for the University of Illinois. And in our official variety trial, uh, we uh, separated into a southern region and a northern region. And for all of you, um, I would look at the, the northern region. Um, to look at the performance there. Uh, I'll show you some of the types of data that, that would be available there. But this website has the summary. And there is one location that's in uh, western Illinois uh, that, that would be relevant for uh, producers in Iowa, at least eastern Iowa. Um, there's also a website, a part of that website is this Fusarium head blight resistance data. Um, so that, that table is, is part of the website, and I've also uh, made that available to you here. We'll pass it out at the end of the presentation. Basically, this is information that I've collected on the fusarium head blight resistance of lines and varieties that have been in the variety trial. Um, and in this particular case, we look at four years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then if you're interested in spring wheat or hard winter wheat, uh, you could go to Minnesota, Nebraska, uh, North Dakota. Those um, states have trials on those different market classes that provide that kind of information. Um, and then a general website that I'm going to mention right here is this last one uh, called ScabSmart. Uh, I'm a part of a large group of people who work on this disease called SCAB. And this is uh, called the U.S. Wheat and Barley SCAB Initiative. Um, and this initiative has put together this website. It's particularly focused on, on SCAB. But if you go to Variety Resistance uh, on that website, and then you can click on different states, and it'll pull up either lists of recommended varieties or access to data from these variety trials. And so you can get information on performance as well as scab resistance at that website. And so that's a, a good resource uh, as well. So here's the kind of data that we would have uh, on the variety trial website for Illinois, the northern region. I just pulled this one table off. This is from 2015, Perry here is the location in uh, western Illinois. Urbana, of course, is uh, east central and DeKalb, sort of central uh, northern Illinois. Um, and so I just pulled out the top lines in here. And you'll notice that uh, the trial over those three locations in 2015 averaged over 100 bushels per acre. And we're not doing anything you know, extraordinary in terms of management to that. I would say it's 
what we call careful management, but not what is sometimes referred to as intensive management. Um, these trials weren't sprayed with fungicide. Um, now, I will say right up front that this was a good year for wheat production in northern Illinois. Um, unlike southern Illinois, where there was too much rain, this was a little bit better area. And you notice that all three of those locations actually averaged over 100 bushels. I think the lowest line in that whole trial was like 87, something like that. So, um, you know, 100 bushel wheat is definitely something that, that is achievable. Now, of course, these are small plots, and you know that that can be uh, higher uh, than if you're looking at a whole field where you have variation across the field. Uh, you notice the test weights here. Um, these are, are what I would consider pretty low uh, test weights, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and that's something that, uh, as a producer, you want to pay a lot of attention to because I'm sure that all of you know if you take low test weight wheat to the elevator, uh, they're going to uh, probably dock you for it, discount you. And then. Um, this table, which I'll, I'll pass out uh, later on, has this uh, scab resistance information. Uh, again, I just pulled out some of the best lines and some of the worst ones, okay? So what we're looking for here are low numbers in this rating that indicates higher levels of, of genetic resistance and lower numbers here and what we call the DON rating. DON stands for deoxynevalanol. Deoxynevalanol is one of the toxins that's produced by the fusarium fungus. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about it. But basically, you want to see low numbers here. So these high numbers, particularly the, the 10 and these high ratings, uh, those are the kind of things that you, you want to avoid. So lower numbers equals better resistance. OK, so let's talk a bit about management practices for wheat. Um, so I'm going to talk first about planting winter wheat. So we assume that you've made your variety selections. And notice that I uh, mentioned planting several varieties. Even if you have a small acreage, I'd still recommend planting several varieties. There's a number of reasons to do that. But one reason is it spreads out the maturities. And as we'll see, Fusarium head blight infects wheat right when it's flowering. And the environment has to be high humidity, wet, rainy kind of environment when it's flowering. And so if that happens, that's when you're going to get infections. Now, one way to minimize that is if one variety is flowering today and another one flowers three or four days later, maybe the first one gets infected, but the second one is flowering in a drier period. It doesn't mean it has more resistance, but it may escape the disease because it's flowering at a different time. Uh, I would recommend planting treated seed. Uh, that helps you to get a good uniform stand. If you're not in an organic situation uh, and you're not an organic producer, I would recommend planting treated seed. Um, you should plant at what we call the Hessian fly free date. I'll show you a map here in a second for that. Um, that's actually uh, a, a day to avoid infection with Hessian fly, but it turns out that's also a pretty optimum uh, date. I always recommend growing in seven inch rows. There's been some research that's done, been done in, in narrower rows. You get a little bit of an increase, but probably not a huge benefit from going narrower, narrower than six and a half or seven. But you will get benefit for seven inch over 15 inch. Now, if 15 inch is, is what you can do, then you plant it in that, but you're, you will see some lower yield in 15 inch as opposed to seven inch. We have some farmers that like to plant because their, their soybean planters are set up on 15 inch. And so if they don't have a drill, they might plant wider rows. But you should drill at seven inch if possible. 
This one is really important for producers in Iowa, I think. Uh, you should plant an inch to an inch and a half deep. Okay, so sometimes I hear farmers say that you just want to like just barely cover with weed and dust it in, and that's that's really not a good practice. You want to get the, the seed an inch to an inch and a half deep, one knuckle. I always say one knuckle deep, um, because the deeper you can get the crown to establish, the more likely it is to survive the winter. And also, the less problems you're going to have with heaving, which uh, freezing and thawing cycles can heave wheat out of the ground. That won't be as much of a problem if the crown is deeper. The crown in wheat uh, might sometimes establish above the seed, but it will never establish below the seed. So if you put the seed just fairly under the surface, that's where the crowns are going to be. And uh, you don't want that. <coughs> um, I recommend 1.3 to 1.5 million uh, seeds per acre. Basically what that translates to is around 21 seeds uh, per foot of row in the seven inch rows. Uh, you want to get a good uniform stand. That is really the key. <coughs> is getting that uniform stand to start with. If you have a poor stand or a spotty stand, then you're reducing your yield potential right from the start. Um, I would recommend applying uh, 30 to 40 pounds of, of nitrogen in whatever form uh, and some phosphorus pre-plant. Uh, conventional farmers often use uh, DAP 1846-0 but uh, the phosphorus and starter nitrogen is important uh, to get that crop established well. If you are planting late, and by late I would say more than two weeks after the optimum date or the flyover date, or if you're planting into a lot of heavy residue, then I would recommend increasing the seeding rate uh, at least 10 to 20 percent. Again, you want to get a good stand. Uh, you want to have at least 21 plants per foot of row, and so uh, increasing the seeding rate if you're planting late is beneficial. Also, what happens is if you plant late, you tend to get fewer tillers in the fall, and so you're going to need more plants per foot of row. Question? What is that fly, fly through date? I'll, I'll show you here in just a second. I've got a map coming up. Um, it's also preferable to follow soybeans rather than corn. Part of that's related to stubble. Um, uh, but also it's a little bit better in terms of considering head blight or scab infection to follow soybeans. But you might also want to plant in the stubble. Any kind of stubble will increase winter survival by trapping snow. Yeah. The uh, suggestion might uh, coming and going is mostly it's going. Mostly it's going? Okay. right there. How's that? Is that better? All right. Thank you. Okay, so that is louder. <laughs> All right. Um, so here's a, um, the, a map of Iowa and this fly-free date that I was talking about. Hutchin fly is a small insect. It lays eggs uh, at the base of the stem plant. Uh, they overwinter there. And in the spring, the larva can, can uh, cause damage and, and actually kill tillers or sometimes a whole plant. Uh, there are, are some genetic resistances to it, but in this part of the country, the best way to control uh, touch and fly is through cultural practice of planting at the right time. If you plant too early, you increase the risk of of Hessian fly damage, as well as uh, damage from other diseases. So here's a, here's a good time to plant. So starting in the northern part, about the middle of September, would be what the target date would be. And then in southern Iowa, about the end of September. So that for winter wheat, that's what I would suggest. Um, if you're a little bit later than that, that's probably not a big problem. Like this year, for example, we had a really late fall, right? The wheat was growing late, late into the fall. 
Um, but on average, those would be good targets. And you definitely don't want to be a week or two before that, okay? A week or two before that is too early, all right? Are you still hearing me back there? Are we good? All right. Okay, so next thing is the top dress of wheat. Uh, I recommend putting uh, 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen on uh, in the spring. Um, in our environments in Illinois, we have not seen generally a lot of benefit to split applying. In other words, putting multiple uh, applications of nitrogen on in the spring. Uh, those of you in organic production, uh, you need to think about this. Obviously, if you put too much material on top of the wheat, that could be detrimental. Um, and typically, farmers apply that nitrogen in our part of the world either before spring green up or right at green up. They like to get on the last couple days before when the, the soil's still frozen uh, and put it on uh, at that time. That's a good practice for convenience, but actually the plant doesn't use the nitrogen then, and it's gonna use it later in the season. So it's harder to do, there's some things that we can do with tram lines or going across the wheat, but in, in terms of nitrogen use, it's probably better to apply it a bit later. Uh, I will tell you that, that most of the nitrogen in Illinois goes on when the ground's still frozen. So, uh, but we recognize that if we could have a good way to get it on there after a little bit later, that would help because that's when the plant needs it. The only exception to that is if you have a late planted crop where you didn't get tillering and you wanna stimulate a lot of tillering, then you need to make sure and get your nitrogen on, on early, okay? So how are we doing here? All right, hmm? we're good? Okay. So uh, I'm not gonna talk much about spring wheat, but most of the same uh, things apply, uh, same recommendations. Uh, the difference here is that with spring wheat, as we're gonna see with spring oats, you should plant as early as possible. And I would say mid-March to mid-April. Um, if I don't have my oats, and this is true for spring wheat, planted by mid-April, I'm getting pretty nervous about it because what happens is then you get caught on the other end, you start getting hot weather, and that shuts down the plants and you get reduced yield, and you can get some of these uh, short periods of time when you get high, high temperature spikes, and uh, that can be def detrimental to the crop. So uh, you want to plant sometime before mid-April, and you want to apply all your fertilizer uh, before uh, planting. Okay, so I'm going to move and, and talk about how can you minimize damage from scab. Uh, I, I work a lot on scab, so I'm always pounding on this, on this one. Uh, but you need to think about how to minimize scab damage because it really, really is essential uh, for profitable wheat production. Um, the reason is that scab reduces yield, reduces test weight. The fungus produces this, this toxin. Actually, it produces a group of toxins. The most prevalent one is the, the deoxynevalanol, or what we call DON. Um, DON is, or deoxynevalanol is detrimental to both humans and livestock. And the problem is, if you're going to sell this wheat, uh, millers have to have uh, one part per million or less of Dawn in product. And so if you try to deliver wheat to a mill and it has more than two parts per million, uh, they're going to start to discount at that point. And you get to about four or five parts per million, and they're probably going to reject that, that load. And so it's really important to have low deoxynevalanol in your wheat. If you're a local product, in, in local production or in organic production and you're going to mill this wheat and then sell that and you've taken the miller kind of out of that market chain, but it's equally important that you have low dawn wheat there 
because you're selling a product that, that people are going to eat, right? So you want to have a good quality product, you need to have it be low dawn. Uh, and five to ten parts per million, uh, we can get by with that for feed wheat, and that's what happens to a lot of our, our high dawn wheat. It goes for feed. Uh, for ruminants, like cattle, they can take up to ten parts per million. Uh, pigs and, and uh, poultry are a little bit more sensitive, and I think that usually they try to have less than five. <clears throat> So if you haven't had uh, the chance to see this disease in the field, um, these are the scab symptoms that you see in the field. Uh, basically, what it is is a premature bleaching of the heads before they would normally turn. And typically, you'll see part or all of the head bleached. It's pretty common to see part of some heads bleached out and then a whole head bleached out in other heads especially in susceptible varieties, the whole head tends to bleach out. If you go in and you thresh them out, that's going to produce shriveled seeds, and the toxin is going to be in those heads. Another symptom that is hard to see here, but if you notice right there, there's a little bit of what I call salmon color. It's at the base of the spikelets, and you only see it usually on a couple of spikelets on a head. But that's also very indicative of scab infection. Uh, this fungus is, the spores are all over the place. Okay, it's an excellent uh, colonizer of corn debris. And so it produces these spores on corn debris and they're flying around. And if the environment is, is right, which is humid conditions, high humidity at flowering time, then that's when the pathogen is going, going to infect the wheat heads, and that's when you're going to see the disease occur. If you have dry period of time over wheat flowering, then it won't be a problem. But as you know, at that time of year, a lot of times we do have those humid, drizzly, wet, rainy conditions. This is what scabby grain looks like, and this is what you don't want to see. Um, these white kernels here that are shriveled are what we call tombstone kernels. Uh, those white tombstones have the toxin in them. Uh, they, they're going to reduce the test weight as well as the yield, and this is uh, really what you don't want to see. All right, so how do we control this? Yep, question. Can you clean it out? That's a great question. I, I skipped over that and I was gonna, I'm, I'll talk about it later, but we'll do it now. If you know you have scab, one of the things you can do is, right there it is, turn up the air on your combine. Okay, now nobody wants to do that. You think you're leaving wheat in the field, but if you have scab infection, turn that air up on the combine and blow it out. Leave it in the field right there where it is. That's the best thing to do. Yeah, thank you. And why not some sort of color tester that can uh, you know, sort out by color? You could do that. You can, that a, color, a, a color sorter, especially you know, if you're in a, in a seed production, uh, you, can, you can clean them out with a color sorter. However, I will tell you this, the tombstones are, are bad, but there's also some other seeds like this one here. You see how it's like what I call dish-faced? It's, it's not filled out properly. So the tombstones are bad, but you're going to have other kernels in there that are not filled out properly, and the color sorter might not kick them the right way. The other problem is that in some cases, uh, depending on the year, and we don't understand why, you can get plump kernels that still have the toxin in them. And that's, that is drives Miller's bonkers because it looks like you got high test weight wheat and you still have the toxin. I hear Bruce over here saying, yeah. So, okay. Um, so the first line of defense against this disease is resistant varieties. 
Okay, so 10 years ago, I started working on this disease longer than I would like to admit, but 10 years ago, we didn't have resistant varieties. But now, breeders have been working on this for a couple of decades, selecting for resistance, and we do have varieties that are not perfect, they're not totally resistant, immune, if you want to think of that in a plant pathology sense, but they do have higher levels of resistance than what we had 10 years ago. So there are resistant varieties available. Um, I already mentioned that you can reduce your risk by planting varieties that have uh, different maturities. Mac? Just, question. Are you, just to clarify, are you advocating interplanting those varieties or side by side? I am advocating side by side. Yeah, not blending. Um, there's also a scab forecasting tool that you can use to assess this, the risk of scab. And I'll, I'll show you that tool in just a second here. Um, if you are uh, in a conventional production system and not organic, uh, you can apply a fungicide that needs to go on at the beginning of flowering, which I'll show you. And there are only two fungicides that you should consider for scab control, and those are Persaro and Corumba, okay? So if you have a consultant and he's trying to talk you into something else, just tell him that you want to plant or you want to apply either Persaro or Corumba. Those two products are the ones that are effective in reducing scab. Do not apply strobilurins, for example, headline, for control of scab. <coughs> The strobile urines actually can increase the dawn level in, in the wheat. So you, you can apply them early for foliar diseases, but don't apply strobile urines at flowering for scab control. Uh, research has been done by the scab initiative by the plant pathologists in that group. It's clearly shown that they will increase the dawn. And then, as we already talked about, if you do have infection, you know you've got a problem. Uh, the the kind of last place where you can pull that out is, is turn the air up on your combine and leave it in the field. Okay, so here's the uh, information about that scab forecasting tool. Um, it's available at this website, and it's also available through these postcards, and I'm gonna pass those out here at the end of the presentation. You can sign up. As far as I know, they won't send you any spam emails or, or anything like that, but this is part of the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative. Uh, we have these uh, scab alerts that can go out, and they're, they're tailored specifically to uh, your location, okay? And so you can get this on your phone or you can get it on your email. And they're um, trying to get as many people as possible to sign up for these so that people are aware of when the, when the risk is high. All right, so what am I talking about forecasting tool? Okay, so here's the forecasting tool. And the previous slide showed the, the URL. Basically what it is is a site where you can go in, and this is a little fuzzy because I, I did a uh, screen chat, uh, capture here, but you basically can pick whether you have winter or spring wheat. You can pick whether you're growing a susceptible or moderately resistant variety. Uh, you can pick the particular date. And this tool is cool because you can forecast a couple days out. It's based on weather data, okay? It's based on like, uh, 10 days of weather data. So if you've had a rainy, wet, high humidity period and it's forecast for another two days of that, then that will increase the risk. And so you see here I've zeroed in on Iowa and this particular time would have been about um, the middle of May uh, last year. And what you see here are green is good, right? The red areas are high risk and the yellow areas are moderate risk. Okay, so the, the, you can look at that and see if you're in an area. It's all based off of the, 
uh, National Weather Service weather stations that are all over the place. And so, um, now of course the question is, you know, that basically this is just going to tell you, am I at risk? Should I go and spray? Or should I not spray? <clears throat> One of the things that I uh, have said is that the higher the commodity price, the more likely I am going to be to go out and spray. But it is something that's worth uh, looking at. But I do recommend that if you think that you're going to have a problem uh, and you're not in an organic production situation, get that fungicide on, even if you have a resistant variety. So here's the information about applying the fungicide for those of you in conventional production. Again, Prosaro or Corumba. Ground application is preferable to aerial uh, because with aerial production, they tend to only put a couple gallons of water and material per acre. And you've got to get the fungicide on the heads in order for it to be effective. <coughs> um, Second thing is that you shouldn't use your flat fan nozzle straight now. Spray this. Because what, what happens is that the flat fan nozzles are for hitting a, a horizontal surface, but the heads are vertical, okay? So you can get better coverage of your fungicide if you use hollow cone nozzles that are angled 45 degrees forward, kind of shoots that fungicide in on the heads. Um, so that, that's just a little tip. They've done a lot of research on how to do this coverage and you should do the application at the beginning of flowering. If you miss it by a couple days, you're okay, but you want to hit right at that stage if possible. You don't want to go too much before that. Go earlier than that, it won't be effective. Right here's the stage you're looking for. Wheat flowers from the middle of the head towards the top and the bottom. So you see these yellow anthers coming out right in the middle of the head. And that's the beginning of flowering. A day or so later, you'll see anthers up here and down at the bottom. So right when you see the anthers starting in the middle of the heads, that's the time when you want to apply the fungicide. And I know there's issues getting across the ground because you've been getting all this rain and now it's muddy. How do you get across the ground? I know that, but you know, that, that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, it varies with variety, but probably only three to five days. And th the other issue you have with this is that later tillers tend to flower a little bit later than the, the primary tillers. Uh, and that was one of the problems we had this past year is there were a lot of uh, more variation among early and late tillers than some years and that makes it more difficult to get the fungicide on at the right time. Yeah, in the back? Another question? Okay. One over there. Yeah, one over there. Okay. I have a question for if you're organic, is there anything that will help prevent that? So if you are organic, you're going to want to be really focused on uh, plant resistance, variety resistance. There is one... Uh, Organic approved fungicide, or I guess it's, a, it's nutrition, but it's called Keplex 350, I believe. Uh, I'm not endorsing it, but an organic farmer that I know uh, has been trying it. I don't know if it works. It's actually not a fungicide. It's a, uh, it's a micronutrient solution. The name again? Keplex, K-E-Y-P-L-E-X, and I think it's 350. So I'm going to have to keep moving here, huh? I got you. you got me? All right. You got the hook? All right. Okay, so variety, as you can tell, variety resistance plus a fungicide is the key. And as I just said, if you're an organic producer, strong host resistance is crucial. And we've done some research that shows that resistant variety plus the fungicide is better 
than either practice uh, individually. Okay? I'll show you this next slide to, to kind of convince you of that. This is some research that Carl Bradley, a plant pathologist, and I did. Um, and basically, on this side, you see the susceptible varieties. We have three of them here. And over here, we have uh, breeding lines that have resistance to Fusarium head blight. <coughs> And then we use Corumba and Prosaro, or no fungicide. And what you see here is that this was in a misted, irrigated nursery. So we're putting a lot of disease pressure on these plots. But we're getting pretty high levels of deoxynevalanol in these susceptibles. But notice this. In, even where we applied the fungicide to these susceptible varieties, we're still getting over three parts per million or up to about five parts per million Don in those, even with the fungicide. So a fungicide can't rescue uh, a susceptible variety if you have heavy disease pressure. And part of it is this difference in tiller maturity. You may protect the, the main tillers, but then the late tillers may get infected or vice versa. So you want to start with a resistant variety. So if you look at these, they were mostly under four. This one got up to five parts per million without the fungicide. I noticed this one, it was like under the two, the magic two ppm, uh, even without the fungicide. Okay, so if I'm an organic producer, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at these two, okay? And then if you apply the fungicide, we're actually getting these under uh, one part per million, and this is under heavy disease pressure. So again, the take home message from this is that if you can combine the two, that's the best route. If you're an organic producer, then pay attention, a lot of attention to the resistance. Okay, I've talked a lot about one disease. There are other diseases. Stripe rust can be a problem on wheat. Uh, leaf rust can be a problem on wheat. Nice thing about Prosaro and Corumba, if you apply them at flowering, they can also protect the flag leaf uh, from these rust diseases. We had a lot of stripe rust this past year. I had one experiment where we applied uh, Prosaro and it shut down the rust as well as protected it uh, from the scab. Okay, so one a uh, little comment about harvest. Um, I recommend that you harvest your wheat at 15 to 18% moisture. Don't wait for it to get down to 13 and a half. Okay? Most of you or some of you, this is especially true if you have drying capacity. You can dry wheat pretty easily just with air without putting any heat on it. And so it's much better to harvest it at a little bit higher moisture and then dry it, okay? Especially if you don't have to apply heat. The reason, now, one thing I will mention that you can't uh, put as much wheat in the dryer as you would corn because it packs tighter, kernels are smaller. You can't force as much air through wheat as you can through corn. So you have to be aware of that. And you can't put too much heat on it if you get it too hot, it will uh, break down some of the proteins and, and the millers uh, will not be happy with that either. So you don't want it to get too hot. But waiting for it to dry down in the field is not a good idea because what happens is every time that you get a heavy dew or rain, the kernels absorb some of that moisture and they puff up a little bit. And then when they dry down, they don't shrink back down as tight as they were originally. And so what happens is every time you get one of those events, you reduce your test weight a little bit more, okay? And also you can run into issues if it keeps getting rain, 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 that's when you run into sprouting problems, okay? And once, you, once wheat has started to sprout, that affects the protein quality, and millers basically will reject it uh, right away because the functionality of the protein is gone at that point, okay? 
So that, that's one, one uh, last thing on wheat. Um, I said don't put yield at the top of your list. And so this is just a comparison of two varieties. I called one Y for yield and one TW for test weight. So in this table, I've got four comparisons here. The price per bushel is all the same, so I didn't change that. I just picked a, a recent price. Um, and the first comparison, I've got 100 bushel yield with 55 pound test weight compared to 80 bushel and 59 pound test weight. You all know that 60 is the standard, right? So we're still at a little bit below that. So these discounts uh, for low test weight, 18 cents of discount. This one had five parts per million Don, 75%, 75 cent discount. These are not numbers that I made up. I pulled these right off of uh, an elevator sheet. So you had a discount of 93 cents for every bushel and a gross return here of $372 which is exactly the same as the 80 bushel wheat with no discounts for test weight or Dawn. And this one had two PPM Dawn, all right? They usually start discounting at three PPM Dawn. And, and different mills will discount at different places, but usually 58 or so, they won't discount above 58. All right, in the next comparison, I made the difference in yield a little less, and the discounts were the same. And in that case, then, the lower yielding is actually returning $46.50 uh, more than the high yielding one. All right? So you say, okay, well, uh, what about if we go back to the 20 bushel difference in this? Um, but I've heard of two mills that are actually paying a premium for uh, high test weight and low Dawn. So one PPM Dawn, I get a uh, and, and high test weight, you get a premium, $8 premium. This is, the f this is the first comparison adding in the premium. And then the next one is the 10 bushel difference in yield, adding in the premium, still have the same discount and in that case, the lower yielding uh, variety is actually returning uh, $55 more than the high yielding one, okay? So you can play around with these numbers, but the point is, unless you want bragging rights at the coffee shop, okay, for highest yield, um, you better pay attention to test weight and Dawn. I would rather brag on that number rather than the actual yield. Yeah, question. Is there usually a correlation between high test weight and high Dawn resistance? Yeah, that's a good question. Is there usually a correlation between high test weight and high Dawn? Not always. You can have high test weight varieties that are scab susceptible. And in that case, you, you could have uh, genetically high test weight and, and still have high Dawn. But in general, that's generally true because the scab reduces the test weight in it also uh, produces the Dawn. But you can have scab resistant lines with low Dawn and low test weight. <coughs> They're under ge different genetic control. All right, so I am not paid by a seed company. I don't sell seed. But I will say that I got this information uh, from someone who does sell seed, and these varieties are available either here in Iowa or in some cases in Missouri. Uh, and um, most of these have a good level of scab resistance. So these might be some that you might want to consider. <clears throat> and, and that actually should be available. Um, yes, they do have that organic. There you go. Thank you. Or you can talk to Mac. Um, okay, so I got to keep moving here, so I'm going to talk about spring oats now. So this is the transition to uh, talk about spring oats. 
Um, this is one of my seed increase fields a couple years ago. Okay, 10 minutes to go, all right. So variety selection, again, you got a group of things you're gonna look at in oats. Barley yellow dwarf virus and crown rust are two diseases that you need to pay attention most to. Uh, lodging resistance and height, something else that you want to think about. Get too much nitrogen on oats and you can put them down. I learned that firsthand this year for sure. Um, and kernel color is something, if you're selling to horse owners, you need to produce white kernel. Uh, the horses don't know the difference, but the horse owners do. And so you got to make sure you have white uh, white for them. Um, barley yellow dwarf virus uh, can cause you a lot of problems. This is a disease that's vectored by aphids and on susceptible varieties you can get this kind of damage. This is a resistant or what I should call tolerant breeding line and um, so you want to pay attention to that uh, and look at that. Here's uh, some data from our Drill plots, which is the variety trial in Illinois. I've attached this table to your handout because it was too small to see on the slides. Three locations, two years. You can see a number of varieties that we tested here. Uh, some from Wisconsin, some from Illinois, some from South Dakota, some from Minnesota. Uh, so a variety of things. Some of these may be too early for your production here. But in addition to yield and test weight, we also look at a number of these other characteristics. And so notice here that rains, for example, was really good for lodging. Uh, it, it stood really well. Uh, notice here that Shelby 427, which is a South Dakota line, was really good for test weight and also for crown rust. So I'm looking at traits other than just the yield and the test weight. And then notice that these three lines were really susceptible to barley yellow dwarf virus. And so they're gonna show more damage from that disease, okay? So that's the kind of data you can get from this variety trial information. I just threw this in to show you some of my plots. These are some of my research plots at the farm. Uh, the research farm where I work. Um, so again, if you're planting spring oats, a number of considerations. Uh, I would select several varieties. Uh, if you're not in organic production, treat your seed. Again, it's really important to plant as early as possible. Again, before uh, mid-April. If you get a little snow on oats, that's perfectly fine. They'll, they'll take that. Uh, I've had that happen. Um, so, again, drill in seven inch rows, again, inch to inch and a half deep, again, 21 seeds per uh, foot of row. And um, you're going to have to decide in your production system of this, whether this is the correct amount. Uh, I would say 60 to 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre, but I will tell you that I had lots of lodging with 80 pounds in my plots this past year, but we had lots of rain events. Um, so you need to be careful with that. But if you're going to push for high yields, uh, you need to make sure they have the fertility. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about spring oats, and I'm sure Bruce may have mentioned this previously, herbicide carryover can be an issue. You need to check the herbicide labels for carryover information for the herbicide that was applied to the previous crop. Those oats are definitely sensitive to some herbicides. We used to see a lot more problems with this prior to Roundup Ready soybeans, but this can be especially a problem following a dry season. So you want to you want to pay attention to that uh, in your rotations. Uh, disease management: you got to plant things that have BYD tolerance and crown rust resistance. If you are not in organic production, again, I would recommend using a fungicide seed treatment. Uh, insecticide seed treatment is available in some areas. At this far north, you probably don't have as much danger year in and year out um, from that as further south. Um, so you probably don't uh, need that if you're planting BYD tolerant varieties. 
And generally, um, fungicide application, Bruce may disagree with me, but fungicide application for crown rust control generally isn't going to be uh, isn't going to be uh, profitable uh, unless you're in a seed production situation. Uh, here's some sources of information uh, on uh, oat varieties. Um, I didn't find the most recent one on the, from Iowa State, but a couple years ago there was a number of varieties, and Stefan may have more recent information on that. And then there's several other states surrounding Illinois, Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota. Look at those different states to find, particularly if you're in northern Iowa, then you could look at some of those northern sites, the Minnesota, South Dakota uh, data. If you're in, in, in southeast uh, Iowa, you might want to look at our variety trial. And here's some, a lot of information at this online Illinois Agronomy Handbook. Uh, this is the URL of the website for it. Uh, Dr. Emerson Nafsinger wrote a chapter in that handbook on small grains and uh, grain sorghum production. There are also chapters on weed control and nitrogen and fertilizer management and that kind of thing. Um, just a picture of one of my uh, little research combines. We're har harvesting a seed increase there on our farm. And that's it. I have my email up here. In case you have questions, you can get in touch with me. Well, thanks, Fred. Yeah, okay, Tom has a question. We have about 15 minutes. Hold on. Wait up, Tom. Is there an improvement in weed control between winter and uh, spring uh, wheat? Is, is there an improvement in weed control between winter and spring wheat? I would say the key thing there is to get a good stand. Um, now, if you have an additional uh, tillage in there before the spring wheat, you may get some winter annuals with that. But in general, um, I would tend to say that winter wheat is going to give you a little bit better weed control than spring wheat because they were already established close to the canopy and competing uh, right from day one in the spring. Other questions? Hold on, let me get you. Can you make any generalizations about uh, soil types and wheat? Um, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> uh, we have some lighter soils in southern Illinois, and uh, depending on the year and the amount of rainfall we get, we'll get good wheat production on that. Those lighter soils tend to be lower uh, yielding. That's also going to be true for uh, corn or soybeans as well. Um, the, I'm in Urbana where we've got the, the flat black, the drummer, silt loam, uh, high productivity. They store a lot of water. On those heavy soils, uh, 1988 was a drought year for us, big time drought year, and we had fantastic wheat yields uh, there at Urbana. And, and the reason was there was no disease, and we got one or two rains early in the season, and that was, that's really all that we needed to get a good, good wheat crop. So heavier soils, yeah, you, you can grow uh, good wheat uh, on heavier soils. And, um, Anybody else? Bruce, do you have a comment on that? No? All right. Is a hard red winter more winter hardy than soft? Thank you for asking that. That's a great question. Uh, some of the hard red winters out of Nebraska and the northern Great Plains uh, should be a little bit more winter hardy than the soft reds. That's true. But if you get soft reds from from, the, from what I call the northern part of the soft red, from, from, from Illinois, uh, Indiana, uh, in the north area, they're, they're going to be pretty winter hardy. Uh, I've been working on, on wheat in central Illinois for about 29 years. I've had one year when I've had pretty much complete winter kill and one year when I've had differential winter kill. But, you know, we seldom get winter kill. Yes.
Uh, soft red winter wheats, by bias, is generally have higher resistance than the hard uh, wheats out of Nebraska and Kansas. Now, they are working on it. They're increasing it. They're improving their scab resistance. Um, but that's a drier area, less uh, historically less risk from scab, and so they don't have as much resistance in their material. The spring wheat, there have been several releases out of North Dakota and uh, Minnesota recently in spring wheat that have better levels of scab resistance. Oh, thanks, Fred. So one other question about, you talk, you addressed, can you plant too early in the fall for heavy fly? I get the question from farmers sometimes. They want to know, well, can I plant my winter wheat early and graze it? Is that going to affect the winter hardiness? I know that's a hard thing to answer, but I do get that question. Yes, can you graze the winter, uh, winter wheat? So in Oklahoma, that's a common practice. They do it all the time down there. Um, the, the, the thing I would worry about there is basically creating a green bridge that when you plant it early, you're going to get uh, more disease resistance and, and you can have more problems. But I don't think that actually impacts the winter hardiness that much uh, because a lot of that top growth gets killed back, uh, you know, in the winter anyway. So did you have a comment on that or, or another question? Hold on, hold on. I've had lots of our hands going up. I'm going to go here and then to Sarah and then to Luke. So I just want to know if you can comment on um, white wheat varieties, soft white and, and hard white both, and the, the suitability for this area and um, disease issues, anything like that. Yeah, so the, co the question is about uh, soft white and hard white and whether they can be grown here and what I know about resistance to scab. So yeah, so you could grow white. White wheat is just two or three gene uh, difference from, from red wheat. Um, the, the hard whites in Kansas are going to be very similar to the hard reds. Um, they probably don't have a lot of scab resistance. Um, they should be winter hardy. Um, but yeah, so they're going to be very similar. The soft white wheats, uh, and typically Michigan and New York have been places where those have been grown. And uh, definitely, you should be able to find some, some soft whites, particularly if you source them out of Michigan, that would be uh, just fine for this area, I would think. Um, and Eric Olson there at Michigan State is working on scab resistance. I'm not as familiar with the uh, resistance of those varieties. Why hasn't the scab resistance been bred in white? Why hasn't it been bred in, like in the hard whites? Um, well, they're probably working on it, but they, I, I just don't know that, that they've done that yet in the, hard, in the hard region. So we're going to check the mic. Can everybody hear that mic all right? Is that better? Yeah. Great. Okay. Sarah? Yeah. At PFI, we had a webinar a, a week or so ago with Klaus Martins from New York, and he had mentioned that he thinks farmers are planting wheats too deep at the one and a half inch. Okay. And he's in like three quarters inch. And so I'm just wondering, is that because he doesn't like have true winter like we do here? <laughs> is that, I mean, is it because of the crown issue or, you know, what's up with depth? I, that's what I want to know more about. So th he's still saying three quarters. So three quarters <laughs> to inch and a half. If you go out there and, and you're drilling it in, you're probably going to have that variation. Um, I like to see the crowns deeper for, uh, especially in your area here because of winter survival. If you get them a little deeper, they're gonna have a better chance of not heaving and surviving the winter. And they'll definitely come up. And this past fall, if you planted wheat, at least where I was, it was really dry. And we had some, I had one planter that was putting them nice and, and deep. And we got, that wheat came up, boom, right? right out of the box, it had enough moisture to get up. I had another planter that wasn't going quite as deep, and there was a lot of that wheat that didn't come up right away. So if you don't have a whole lot of moisture, that'd be another reason why I'd want to put it deep. But you know, I won't argue with three quarters or inch and a half. I think it's, in that range is good. Quarter inch, no way. 
Thank you. Uh, I had a question. We flew on a bunch of barley and oats and had a really great fall for covers this year. And uh, they're, all, they're both kind of winter kill. Uh, and we flew those on into beans. And uh, they're both about dead now. Um, I'm excited to hear that you, you think we could, we could drill right into that and put in a small grain. Um, but but is, weren't those, if they were seeded before the fl Hessian fly date, um, we, were, we seeded ours in like late August uh, for the cover crop. Is there risk to, to having carryover diseases that we could experience? There shouldn't be a problem with Hessian fly because it infects wheat. Um, and if, you're, if they're killed, there shouldn't be a problem with uh, barley yellow dwarf virus. I, I, I guess right off the top of my head, I don't see any disease issues with that. Since the, the crop get, is getting killed and uh, you know, you're not carrying any of those disease organisms, like if you planted wheat early and it got infected with barley yellow dwarf virus or something else, those plants are still surviving and the organism could as well, the pathogen. But I don't see any issues with that. That's a little out of my area of expertise, but um, yeah. Fred, uh, we have a number of growers interested in growing cereal rye as cover crop seed, and yeah. a number of them have approached me. They're, they're worried about um, using fungicides. Would those fungicides that you mentioned for winter wheat for fusarium also apply to cereal rye? I have no idea. <laughs> just I don't I'd know. Check. <laughs> He's just trying to stump his old advisor, you know. A few months, a few months ago, at the Iowa Organic Association meeting, there was a speaker from New York and a farmer, and he uh, told us uh, if you're thinking about growing wheat on an organic rotation, you don't ever want to have hairy vetch on your farm. Is there a problem with getting the hairy vetch out of the seed, and the miller's going to reject it? Um. I will not go against that. I do not have experience with that, but I would, I would uh, agree with that. It is probably hard to remove from wheat. I'm going to put my friend Bruce Roskins on the spot there because he's a miller. Yeah, from what I've heard, the soft wheat millers particularly seem to have a problem with, you know, getting the vetch and stuff separated from the seed. And it's, it can, it's, it's a multi, uh, multi problem. What I'm trying to say is there's color issues and stuff with the seed in the flower. There's a problem with some of the functionality to it then. And then there can be flavor issues and stuff like that. It's tough to get out. So... I've been told by the soft millers, particularly out east, like the seamer milling and those people, uh, they don't like it. But, you know, it's generally not a problem, you know, here in the Midwest. Cut me off whenever. You've got seven minutes. Okay. Oh, this just had to do with the uh, hairy vetch and the wheat. I, a guy I rent from, he had a neighbor who actually tried intentionally putting hairy vetch and wheat together because he thought he could get the nitrogen from the hairy vetch with the wheat and then separate them out using a seed cleaner, but he never could find anywhere that was willing to clean it out just because, and we've actually tried it ourselves, growing hairy vetch and rye together. We thought, well, you know, you get your nitrogen, separate them out, but the seed size is close enough that the screens weren't able to separate them out. But now in our rye, we've been keeping our own seed. We just bought some variety, not stated, and mixed the hairy vetch in. And we've just been reusing it for our own cover crops to save on seed costs. And actually, we've kind of noticed that the hairy vetch has kind of petered out over time because when we planted the rye, we didn't uh, inoculate the vetch or anything. And you'd have some plants that would seem to um, nodulate and start growing rather well, but we don't have, it's not like it's really infected or infested our bunch a whole lot. You know, we might see a few plants here and there, but it is, has kind of died out over time where we've done rye. Um, there's a history of, of wheat grown in northeast Iowa that would date back to 1860, but disease took it out of widespread use. My question to you is, is there an understanding of the evolution of the basic diseases in small grain? Are the diseases different than they were 100 years ago, 
Are they better or are they worse? Or are, is climate change influencing disease? So I want, I want to know that climate change is influencing diseases, but diseases change over time, and uh, the pathogens can develop uh, new, re new ways to attack the, the host, and they change. The, there are different races, particularly of the rusts, and so um, that's part of the issue is that the old varieties are susceptible to the new races of the pathogen. The second thing, too, is that our agriculture has changed dramatically. And uh, I don't think any of you are doing any moldboard plowing. And that buries a lot of moldboard plowing, buries a lot of, of uh, uh, residue and debris. And uh, particularly some of the fungi can colonize that debris. And then the spores are available to infect a new crop. But, uh, Obviously, we've gone away from that, and so that's one of the reasons why uh, scab has become more prevalent is because there's more corn debris on the surface to provide more spores. And, and also, frankly, you know, up in the Red River Valley, they didn't used to produce a lot of corn, but corn has moved up into that area, and so fusarium head blight has become a much bigger problem up in that area. So, I wouldn't say it's climate change. I think it's more, you know, different changes in the pathogens over time resulted in uh, those, um, those varieties being more susceptible. Now, the weather patterns could be occurring, and we may tend to get these rainfall events at a slightly different time. You know, the probability of getting rain at the time when wheat's flowering may actually be increasing. I haven't looked at that. Um, your map on, uh, I guess it was Hessian fly, showed that uh, in central Iowa, we should wait until at least September 20th to plant right. wheat? Yeah. OK. When do you know it's going to be too late? To ah, that's plant? a good question. You tell me what the fall weather is going to be, and I'll tell you when it's too late. How's that? <laughs> uh, this year, you could have planted really late. Um, but most years not. Um, so I'll tell you this, I planted last year by necessity at one location, November 1st in central uh, Illinois, if you know where Effingham is. And I got a stand, but if I had been a farmer, I would have destroyed it. Um, and I didn't get any data from it, but I did have a stand. So, you know, that, that would be essentially a month later than our optimum planting date. So I'm going to say that two or three weeks later, you should be just fine. Um, but once the later it goes, the more you want to increase your seeding rate and the more likely it is that you're going to have issues. Now, I have seen wheat that's come through the winter barely spiked out of the ground. And if you get good tillering in the spring, you can get a crop out of it. But that's on the ragged edge of being able to, yeah. You know, the problem you have is that if it's uniform in the spring, then you have a decision to make. But if there's a big, big patch, there's no plants, and then another spot where you've got plants, then you're probably looking at tearing it up. A question okay, behind you. Okay. Well, I we have t time for one more, and I, okay. I saw Earl, so we're going to give it to Earl. Okay. Um, this is a question in regards to the, the markets for wheat here in Iowa. I don't, how many people have, are raising wheat right now or have? You know, are you selling it locally? Are you selling it to, like, Bruce Grain Millers? Where is the, you know, I've never raised any. I'm thinking about it. Where are the real viable markets for it as a grower? And is, is it in both the soft and the hards, or are they both equally needed? Or Yeah, I can't answer that at all for you. I, I, I don't know for Iowa. Did, so Arlen's saying Kansas City. <coughs> you know, haul it to Kansas City, but we're close to Kansas City. You know, we're right down on the line. So, and usually a fifty cent premium for hard, but the yield drag is uh, offsets that benefit. Did he hand these out? Oh. 
there's another. There's another one. with it. Uh, we're not buying large volumes because what we do buy we grind to put into mixes for some of the uh, conventional uh, cereal bars and stuff like that. Our current bid today nominally is about 580 on the hard red. Uh, but again, it's you know fairly small volumes, and I just looked. She hasn't got a new crop bid posted this morning and stuff on it, so I'd have to call to get a bid for you on that. Okay, I think that topic might come up uh, in the panel of of growers we have later, and also kind of the the final curtain call of of, of presenters and growers that we can bring up that topic. Um, Fred has been passing out some of the materials that he brought with him and referenced in his presentation. They are up front as well if you want to to grab a copy. Um, let's uh, thank uh, Fred for coming all the way up from Illinois and, and presenting to us. Thanks.